Hi, I'm Linda Quinlan. I'm Ann Charles. I'm Keith Ghostland, and this is All Things LGBTQ. We are taping on Tuesday, July 28th. We tape in Montpelier, which we recognize is being unceded indigenous land. And before we move on to our headlines, we will be doing interview shows. Our next show, which will be a week from this broadcast, we will have Becca Ballant, Ember Quinn, and Brenda Churchill all talking about what it's like to be LGBTQ plus politicians and candidates. So with that, I guess I do the headlines. And um, my headlines for today are Trump supporters start a kill transgender uh, chant in Shaler Township in Pennsylvania. Lovely group. Mm. Alaska Town passes LGBTQ protections. Arizona County <coughs> ends anti-LGBTQ and lesbian adoptions to save money. AIG refuses to pay insurance for a gay deputy that died of coronavirus. Washington State may elect a bisexual to Congress in November. Beth Doglio would become the state's first LGBTQ person elected to Congress. North Dakota's GOP platform says that LGBTQ people recruit children and they prey on women. Madonna was fined a million by Russia for supporting LGBTQ publicly in 2012 at a concert. She has steadfastly refused to pay. The far-right group Million Moms is now targeting Hallmark. The Christian group is an offshoot of the anti-LGBTQ hate group American Association. Bisexual Senator Kristen, Kristen Semenis Wiggs has conservatives flipping theirs. The Democrat <laughs> from Arizona is a fashionable politician and is breaking another tradition by wearing colorful wigs to work. And I have a picture of her in a bright, I think it was blue, uh, wig. So, uh, Kristen Cinema, huh? Yeah, uh huh, uh huh. The far right group. Uh, oh, let me see. Uh, Baltimore. I see you, Doctor Joseph Coster, dies of coronavirus in his husband's arms. 20 other colleagues at the hospital were at his side holding vigil. He was 56 years old and leaves behind his husband, David Hart. An LGBTQ professor found dead in his North Carolina home. Southern Farm Queens in a new reality show. And trans Latino Marissa Marilyn Cazares was murdered. So we'll have more of stories in detail. So we'll go to Anne with her international stories. Well, when I was uh, going over my headlines, it became clear that my, only my first two stories are negative and the rest is positive, although some of the uh, good news is qualified. So let's start with the bad news. Thousands of Christians protest in Haiti against the new penal code. And the penal code liberalizes LGBT concerns. Um, it is going to take effect in 24 months. Uh, the president supports it. It criminalizes discrimination based on um, sexual orientation and penalizes forced sexual relations between a human and an animal. And Christians are up in arms about this. They're distorting it and saying, you know, terrible things about it. Then in a gesture of cowardice, um, Netflix has pulled a show as Turkey objects to a gay character. And the show was called If Only. It was pulled when the government objected to the gay character. And what's especially reprehensible is... Um, the streaming com company has seen demand for its services grow 
during the coronavirus pandemic. It added 10 million subscribers in the second quarter of this year, taking it to 193 million subscribers, and they can't afford to stand up to Turkey. So, uh, it's, that's right. Um, it's not the first time. Letter writing. Although, yeah, I know, I know. It uh, has uh, pulled something before in April. It's been, um, in April, there was unfounded speculation that another show, Love 101, would feature an openly gay character and that, you know, it didn't even materialize, but the government was up in arms. And um, so those are my two bad headlines. Now, I'd like to move on and talk a little bit, maybe I'll just do the headline, yeah. about the Tahini War in Israel featuring the Queen of Tahini. Um, I'll tell you, her name is Julia Zahar, and I'll show you a picture now of her and get ready for this story. Um, Polish courts, I re recall that that awful election occurred. Um, it's being protested, um, but there's a very little chance that anything will happen with the opposition challenge. Still, Polish courts annul LGBT ideology-free zones, finding they violate the Constitution, so that's good news. Thai LGBT activists raise pride flag in an anti-government rally, and the situation in Thailand is really very grave. A coup occurred, um, and in... Uh, and a civil partnership law is in the works, and LGBT people are up in arms about it because it's not marriage. So anyway, the um, LGBT activists in Thailand are at work. The U.S., and this is also kind of unaccountable and strange, the U.S. sanctions che Chechen leader Karadoff for human rights abuses. This is Pompeo. All of a sudden, Pompeo has recognized uh, what's going on in Chechnya, but of course he never mentions LGBT, you know, the purge of LGBT right. people. He does acknowledge human <coughs> rights abuses. So Karadov can't, and his family can't come to the U.S. Um, Sudan repeals the death penalty and flogging for same-sex relations. And this is also um, almost... That's progress, right? It is pro Well, it's qualified victory, and it's also... I don't know why they did it. It's kind of unaccountable, because homosexuality remains um, illegal, and um, but I guess taking the death penalty off the table is a good move. Of course it is. An Iranian refugee wins transgender rights case against Hungary. Hungary is another terrible place. Uh, this Iranian transgender person moved to Hungary um, and was accepted as an asylum seeker because of his gender identification. So Hungary acknowledged that he's discriminated against in transgender, but then when he tried to change his diplomatic forms, they refused. And it went up the courts, up the courts. Finally, a European court has um, granted this person a right to um, change their gender identification. And they also awarded damages. So I have a small question, speaking of Poland. Um, I thought if you were in the European Union, you had to. Um, be part of whatever their rules and regulations are, like gay marriage, abortion, you know, all those kind of things. I thought you had to adhere to that or not be part of the EU. You is think that, po you think Poland is part of the European yes, Union? Yes, it, it is. is. And this, if I may expatiate, yeah. this is the European Union. I think that's probably why one reason that they changed, they modified their stance on LGBT free, jo free zones because... Um, the European Union is putting pressure on them. Um, 
They because don't they agree to this, right? They agree when they join the EU that they right. have to adhere to right. certain. And there's a parliament that right. creates right. their guiding principles. Yeah. And the European Parliament um, has, on women's rights and gender equality, urged the European Commission to freeze funds mm -hmm. from the regions that might be used in where these LGBT oh, zones good. exist. Oh, good. doing something. Yeah. I mean, they're... Um, put pressure on them. They are. They are. And it's... I think it may be effective. Okay, so thank good. you for asking that question. And um, let me continue with my headlines, if I may. And these are more cheerful headlines. From victim to protector, Pakistan's first trans cop fights for justice. And let's see a picture of her. Her name is Reem Sharif. And she was bullied and had a terrible time, had to leave school college and finished her courses online because of um, transphobia in Pakistan, but now she's a cop and so she's um, oh. acting as a protector for trans people. Uh, another exciting story, and I have a clip to go along with this uh, that I'll show in my first segment, um, involves Denise Ho, who has, there's just been a documentary published um, released about her, and she's a Hong Kong lesbian activist, singer, popular singer of a, in a genre called canto pop, which is um, written in traditional Chinese with Cantonese lyrics. And so I want to talk more about her in my segment. And finally, uh, right now actually, let's take a look at a picture of Denise Ho but you'll see more in the clip. And finally, um, I'd like to mention an Olympian Olympic, ro Olympic rower from New Zealand who has come out. Uh, her picture is before you now. Her name is Emma Twig. She's on the left, and she's here with her spouse, Charlotte <coughs> Mitzi, who's on the right, and Charlotte also is an athlete. And... Um, Emma was motivated to come out by her marriage to Charlotte Mitzi. So there they are. Hmm. And those are my headlines. Okay. All right. I was going to say, there's a U.S. case <coughs> that I didn't hear you mention, uh, political asylum, where the U.S. government first granted asylum and is now saying no. Oh, I didn't see that. It, no. HRC put it out today ah. asking for people to respond. I didn't wow. write all the details down. But our, the U.S. government is saying because he was previously married to a woman, he's not gay. Oh, okay. <laughs> and therefore, he is not under threat. But, so, well, that would knock me out. There, but we've forgiven you. <laughs> this week's, trivia, this week's trivia question. <laughs> Over the years, LGBTQ plus Vermonters have enjoyed some high visibility in access to the mainstream <coughs> political process, starting with the recognition of liaisons to the office of the governor by then-Governor Madeleine Kunin in 1986. Beth Dingham was the first lesbian recognized. Who was the first gay man? So, have you been socially isolating for way too long? <laughs> Do you need some company? Give Cottage core lesbians, a look on Tic Tac, Tumblr, or Pinterest. This is the tag to it. All at once, everyone seems to want to quit their jobs and run off to upstate Vermont to pick apples, raise chickens, and live their best woman loving woman life. You may find some company in that rural yurt raising chickens. So, I want to acknowledge that Sunday, July 26th, was the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, groundbreaking legislation that extended protection to people living with disabilities in public accommodation, employment, transportation, and government services. We're going to talk a little bit about Canada, good and some bad. Then we're going to talk about the census. You keep hearing me going on about it, but there's a little twist to it right now. 
Remember, August 11th is the primary. Elections do matter. We are going to be watching Debbie Ingram, who is running for lieutenant governor on the Democratic ticket, and Taylor Small <coughs> for a House seat in Winooski, Chittenden 6-7. Not that we're giving any support, mind you. You also may admire my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it's a and lovely shade of... <laughs> Rainbow Umbrella is continuing to meet with the new <coughs> chief of police. If you have an interest or you have something that you feel should be brought to his attention, please be in touch with Rainbow Umbrella. Be checking those local organization websites for what they're doing online. And if they're starting to transition into some in-person events, because as restrictions lessen, there could be more happening. Momentum is, the next one is Sunday, August 9th at 11, be posted on the Rainbow Umbrella site. We're going to talk about the legislature and one piece of legislation in particular that really got my attention, and then a little bit about a rise in bias and hate <coughs> crimes here in Vermont. Mm. But the last positive, LGBT, LGBTQ plus political rep representation in America, within the past year, has increased by over 21%. <coughs> so even as the federal administration has been trying to push back, we have truly been rising up. So, Did you see that clip? Oh, you're not, you don't do Facebook, but there's no, this clip on uh, they're evil. a big fight that happened in Montpelier. Yeah, between the police and the okay, yeah, I, citizens. I saw... No, um, front Porch supporters and Front Porch por defenders. Forum had and Digger both had articles yeah. mm -hmm. that there was a rally planned by a group supporting thin law blue. enforcement, yeah, thin blue line, and that the Black Lives Matters came as a counter demonstration, and it got fairly nasty. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that was. It's here. Isn't well, it? and as we talk, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, on, on a good note, um, LGBT political represent, representation jumped 21% in the past year. 843. <laughs> didn't I just say that? Did you? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> because I didn't hear you it say it in the headlines. Important. It's an important fact. Yes. Over 843 <laughs> openly. Oh, I'm sorry. I yep. must have spaced that out. It's okay. And I was listening, too. I could have reported on it also. <laughs> I saw the headline. There. So moving on. <laughs> okay, so moving on. Um, Trump supporters start a kill transgender chant in Shaler County, Pennsylvania. The rally was in, in favor in support of the police at a Black Lives Matter rally. They began this chant at the edge of the Black Lives Matters group. The unidentified man was caught on video shouting the phrase repeatedly in front of the middle school where about 100 people attended the Black, Life Red, Black Lives Matter rally. While, it, while some of the cohorts that he was with joined in the chant, it seemed that most people on both sides of the debate looked on in shock. So um, that's that one. Alaskan town passes LGBTQ protections after a local business refuses to serve gay people. In Ketcha, Ketchikan, Alaska, the town boasts that it has the largest standing Native American collection of totem poles, which is their claim to fame. It also has a thriving tourist industry, and locals know that discrimination is bad for business. <clears throat> in, order, in ordinance prohibiting discrimination against LGBTQ people uh, passed in the city council unanimously. Local florist Heather Dalin, owner of Heavenly Creations, made news for refusing to take an order from a same-sex couple wedding. When it comes to 
uh, the Holy Scripture, she said. The holy sacrament of marriage and God's word is clear. This ordinance strips me of my rights and is trying to force me to participate in a ceremony that violates God's holy truth. Is this still Alaska? Yes. Yep, yep. That's the woman who caused this whole ruckus where, you know, she wouldn't sell, and so the council voted unanimously to pass a... Um, Anti-discrimination? Yeah, yeah, to sort of thwart her from, you know, because it's bad for business, so... So my question about this is, are the totem poles appropriative of Native American culture? Well, I don't know. I would, you know. And they may be Native. No. I thought when you were saying it, they were Inuit. So I, that I it, don't know that. Oh, I okay. do not know that. Okay. But I do know that that's... They're clean that's, the, that, that's why people Go are attracted there. to the area. Okay. It's probably on one of those cruise ship lines or something, I would guess, maybe. Okay. But, A modification. Yeah. <laughs> AIG refuses to pay a life insurance claim for a gay deputy who died of coronavirus. Shannon Bennett, Gay Broward County, Florida, sheriff's deputy, was a first responder. AIG is refusing on the basis that there is no proof that he caught the deadly disease while working. Yep. <laughs> so far, the company has refused to pay twice. Now the insurance company is saying that coronavirus was not specifically listed on um, what's allowed to be paid when you die. So it doesn't count. Darren Bennett, his husband, said it's not about the money, but the disrespect and greed of this insurance giant. The case is being appealed again, and good luck. Not surprised by that. No. And then <clears throat> there's an anti-LGBTQ professor found dead in his North Carolina oh, home. Oh, an anti-LGBTQ. Anti, yeah. Mike Adams is also a, poli a political columnist in Washington, D.C. Authorities do not suspect foul play. The police were at his house when someone called for a wellness check. So they went to check on him because somebody called. He didn't think that schools should shut down during the pandemic, <clears throat> but they should shut down non-essential majors like women's studies and black history. Mm -hmm. He tweeted that stay-at-home orders were like slavery and was heard saying, let my people go about the stay-home orders <coughs> of North Carolina. So I don't know if it was suicide or he died of... Yeah, they're not Cold saying. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, what they're not saying, but um, you know, it's odd. Lovely character. Um, okay, uh, Keith, you have. Oh, Anne, sorry. <laughs> on to the second. I am at the ready. <laughs> on to your. <laughs> on to your first segment here. Okay, I'd like to talk about the Tahiti War, um, in Israel. So Julia Zahar, let's see a picture of her again, is the owner of a company that makes some of the most popular tahini in Israel. She made a donation to a gay rights group recently, um, and she saw it as an unremarkable act. She's an Arab Israeli, and she donated to a hotline. Um, is tahini a food? Mm-hmm. Oh, in hummus. Yeah, mm -hmm. tahini. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. She's known as the That's queen of tahini ah. in Israel. <laughs> so she donated to this LGBT organization called Aguda, and Aguda on July 1st thanked her publicly. Um, and the point of the donation was to help set up a hotline for Arab-speaking Israelis. Everybody was up in arms. The religious Arabs uh, <laughs> condemned homosexuality. The religious Jews condemned her act. Um, there was all kinds of anti-gay backlash. Um, somebody showed a picture of um, his store clerks removing all the tahini from the grocery store shelves. 
a big boycott. People called for a big <laughs> boycott. Um, she's 65, kind of mild mannered, they said, uh, a former school teacher. And what happened was her husband died unexpectedly of a heart attack. So she took over this floundering tahini business and turned it into a booming concern. She's Nazarene, and there are factories that are um, all over Israel, um, pr primarily in the West Bank. But then, after the backlash, um, oh, and then she was also criticized by gay Arabs because she went through an Israeli organization, and we know what Israel's doing in the um, Palestinian right. territories. Um, however, um, it turned around, and LGBT people uh, viewed it, and other leftist and liberal thinking people viewed this whole controversy as a teachable moment. So, um, so they went out and bought all that. <laughs> so the Tahiti has been bought also, <laughs> it's, um, and it's only the this gesture is only the latest in a series of public demonstrations in support of Arab gays and lesbians. In May, thousands of mourners attended a funeral of a gay dancer who drowned in the Mediterranean after helping save the life of a friend. Last August, hundreds of people protested in Haifa after the stabbing of a young transgender Arab. Um, what we have been seeing is the taboo slowly being broken down, an activist said. Everything happened in the past year is the culmination of the work that has been done over the past two decades, all the efforts activists have made to promote social change on this issue. Ms. Zahar's phone has been ringing constantly over the past week, and she's puzzled by the uproar. I never could have imagined that something like this would happen, she said. It doesn't make sense. You do something positive, and then you get something negative in return. <laughs> but, you know, the cumulative <clears throat> effect of this gesture has been positive. So the queen of Tahini has made a mark. Can we order? One I don't know. We could try. <laughs> Israel might be a long ways away. Yeah, um, but they import. So if you knew the brand name, you'd just look on the shelf to see if it's being carried here. Maybe. That's right. And... I'm sure I could dig up the brand name also. But now let me go on to Denise Ho, if I may. Okay. Um, because, you know, we've been listening to everything that's been happening in the news about Hong Kong and the various, uh, the pro-democracy movement is uh, being smacked down China is imposing all these kinds of draconian measures. Um, we haven't done anything in the United States, have we? Well, we're, think, we're boycotting it, I think. We're, um, Trump is suggesting a boycott okay. as a gesture against China. Oh. And other European countries are also, and you know, my question is, if you boycott Hong Kong, how does that help the people in Hong Kong? But we have a doc, there's a documentary that's just come out called Becoming the Song, Denise Ho, Becoming the Song. Um, and this documentary profiles a singer who's become an influential activist in the democracy movement. It maps the life and career of canto pop singer Denise Ho, who has used her platform to become one of the most influential pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong. Her story may be of particular note at this moment as China's new security law, and that's what they're all uh, demonstrating against, mm -hmm. imposes more restrictions on the region. Her parents left Hong Kong and moved to Montreal in 1988, four years after Britain and China settled on a joint agreement that would hand the territory over to China in 1997 but allow it to retain autonomy. I mean, I was suspicious of that. From oh, the I knew beginning. that it was going to go south. Yeah. I know, it, and I think Britain was kind of pusillanimous in that regard. Um, anyway, the, her parents saw the light and got out of there. Um, but Denise Ho 
um, became inspired by an early canto pop singer, Anita Mui, who's referred to as the Madonna of the East. And she was also a pro-democracy activist and nurtured the values Ho says made her the person she is today. Uh, so she moved back to Hong Kong in 1996 after winning a singing contribution uh, competition, that is to say. She eventually came out as a lesbian, joined the pro-democracy demonstrations in 2014, and faced both arrest and significant commercial backlash as a result. Now she's banned in China as a lesbian. These setbacks didn't stop her. The film does an excellent job of introducing the pop star to unfamiliar audiences like us, contextualizing her activism and more broadly, examining the role art can play in shaping our beliefs. And before I show you the clip, I just want to call your attention to this group called Kino Lorber. It's a virtual film company. So you can go Google Kino Lorber, get a ticket, and watch the documentary. We learned about this on Gay USA. Ann Northrup watched it and recommended it. And Linda and I are going to tune in as soon as we can. But anyway, let's look now at the clip. Denise Ho um, becoming the song. Denise Ho is a brilliant canto pop singer. She was huge in mainland China. We would always feel like she's the perfect idol. The record companies, they just didn't know what to do with me. And I wasn't ready to conform to you know, what they expected. I was pretty obvious with my songs and everything. I had concerns for people around me, and I started thinking you know, maybe there's more that I can focus on. She thinks it's more important to do what's right than to worry about her own stardom. Protesters, mostly students, are demanding full democracy. Every Hong Konger, no matter what they do, they could potentially be sent to China where there's no rule of law. If we pass that, there's no turning back. She was really with students on the streets. She didn't act like she was some kind of superstar. She already knew the consequences. If you're not welcome in China, nobody would want to touch you. For the first time in Hong Kong, you see these people fighting for something that they believe in. And I was screaming, Yay, go! We're proud, and that's why we support her here as well. Because I think she truly represents Hong Kong, and she is a true Hong Konger. That was good. I like where it shows her. She comes out at a gay pride parade, and it, you know that's even that's in the clip too. So she's a very energizing figure. Um, should I continue, or do you want to? Um... Well, let's let let's let Keith go now, and then we'll, <laughs> then we'll get back to me, and then you, and I think we'll have some extra time. So because I see more papers on that. Yes. That, oh yeah, I have so. many many things to talk so about. So Canada. They're having their 15-year anniversary of marriage equality. However, acknowledgement of 15 years and then a story coming out of Ontario. Lesbian couple approached an officiant to perform their marriage ceremony who refused based on my religion does not support this marriage. They then went to look for the videographer who, as 
one of the members of the couple said, all you had to do was tell me you were booked for that day. But the videographer made a point of saying, I absolutely disagree with what you're doing. I stand in opposition. Mm. It was a condemnation. And she's like, this isn't right. So there is action occurring regarding all of that. Both so in even, Ottawa? It, it, it is a couple Ontario. in Ontario. Ontario, okay. Right. But, and it was the same couple who had first been rejected by the officiant right. and then was rejected by the videographer because it was a lesbian marriage. Mm. So the census... Starting August 11th, if you haven't filled out the census application, someone may show up at your door looking for information, and they will be doing that until October 31st. On our last show, I warned you that that trick-or-treater may actually be a census taker in disguise. Uh, Vermont has come up a bit. We are still estimate is that we're dramatically underreporting. And again... This, it is that count that determines the level of federal funding to which the state would qualify. And I did qualify. it. It's really easy. All you have to do, if you have a computer, go online. It takes two seconds. Okay, but that's the problem here in Vermont. Broadband, yeah. lack of computer access, and ensuring that it's <clears throat> in the correct language. Yeah. But, but here's the other twist, is the census is also going to be used for redistricting the House of Representatives. Mm. The federal administration is trying to put a block on the inclusion of undocumented immigrants <coughs> as part of the census. Right. And it, 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 there has been constitutional cases by the Supreme Court that clearly says everybody gets counted, regardless of status. And that but a lot of people they, are rightly, you know, rightly or wrongly afraid to do that. I mean, do well, that's, that's why coming to your door and the assurance of, I'm just asking for <coughs> numbers. You do not have to disclose. You don't have to show me right. the green card, any of that. But part of this is that they were able to track back and clearly document that the intent is, is through some of the southern states clearly shifting it from a blue to a red district, that this is one of those maneuvers to try and uphold the gerrymandering that they've been doing to create some of the most bizarre legislative districts you've seen. Mm -hmm. So, And then when we come back around, I'm going to talk a little bit about a bill in our Vermont legislature that really got my attention in the rise in our hate crimes here. Mm -hmm. So, Okay. So, these, I'm going to show you a picture of southern farm queens and how they deal with breeders. On a new reality show, queens to the rescue went down to a farm to fight for animal rights. In Easley, South Carolina, they had a furry photo shoot. This was a charity event which supported Izzy's Pond, a wildlife rescue center. So here's their picture, and they are quite, they look quite entertaining. And you might want to check out their show. It's a worthy cause. Yeah. And I guess there's been some problems <coughs> with Ellen DeGeneres. Um, you know, a lot of people said that um, it's in a, a toxic culture there. Um, Permission and to say t tacky things? Yeah. This, this has been an open secret for years. I know. This, 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 this isn't, I mean, within the queer community. Yeah. Th this conversation's been going on for a long time. Did you hear what happened to her today? No, what? She got robbed. Yes, while she was taping her show, her mansion was robbed. Oh, my gosh. Really? <laughs> yeah. well, we should be careful. Did you lock the door? No, I didn't. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, but people don't know when we tape. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and my God, I had no safe. idea. It just no. had to do with the... Uh... The toxic report? <laughs> I don't know. I probably... Anyway... Yeah. Probably not. Um, Warner Media, which is the company that has her show, has launched an internal investigation that will be led 
by the company's employment relations. So we'll see how that goes. Huh, I don't know what to think I know. of that. I know. Uh, there's been a lot of complaints, though. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and racist stuff, too, apparently. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Predominantly I don't think racism. by her specifically, but by people who she were, she are in charge of it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Mm. But a 20 year old, 21 year veteran of the Memphis Fire Department was shot to death in a park last week, last Wednesday. And the man who shot him allegedly admitted to it, saying that the firefighter hit on him and made him feel uncomfortable. Carton Wells, 23, and his girlfriend, Daniil Mack, 39, were arrested by Memphis police this past Friday in connection to the death of Mac Bond, 58. According to the police report, Wells admitted, admitted to the killing and said it was Bond's fault for hitting, on hitting, up, hitting him up uh, in public. Wells told investigators that he and Mac were hanging out in a rented car in Kennedy Park in Memphis, which is a gay uh, cruising um, place. He said Bond approached him and his girlfriend and hit on them, which made Wells feel uncomfortable. He said he pulled out a gun and shot Bond multiple times. Mack and Wells drove away and Bond died at the scene. They were arrested two days later. Wells has been charged with second degree murder and possession of a handgun as a convicted felon. Mack has been charged with tampering with evidence since she drove the car back to the rental shop and claimed that there was a transmission problem in order to exchange it. The gay panic defense is uh, when a defendant in an assault or murder says they acted in a state of temporary insanity, uh, some, someone of the same sex made unwanted sexual advantages, advances. It can be used to argue that they had diminished capacity or were acting in self-defense. And it is based on the idea that gay people, especially gay men, are predators or that being gay is a provocation. Eleven states have banned the gay panic defense, but Tennessee is not one of them. The state's hate crimes law include sexual orientation. It is not yet known if Wells will use the gay panic defense so it's an awful story it is an awful story um i'm not sure that i believe that he even was bothering them but i know when i've heard this debated actually here in vermont the women's community came back and said if being hit on was justification for homicide, there would be a whole lot of fewer men here. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Yeah. But I'm, yeah. Sorry. The male panic defense. There we go. On July 13, another sad story. Marilyn Cazares was found dead in an abandoned home set ablaze in Browley, California. She is the 23rd known transgender person moved, murdered or violently killed in 2020. This is already close to the total number of known murdered trans, pe trans people from all of 2019, which was 27. While an exact cause of death hasn't been released, it is believed that Marilyn was living in the building where she was found. Police are investigating the death as a homicide. A march is being organized by her family for August 1st in front of the building. Um, in the county, demanding justice for Marilyn and protesting against transphobia. So mm. very sad story there. Well, let's go to Mexico City. In a virtual session, Mexico City's lawmakers passed the bill which received broad cross-party support. This is the bill outlawing gay conversion therapy. Um, its approval makes the Mexican capital, which in 2009 was the first region in the country to legalize same-sex marriage, the first jurisdiction in Mexico to ban the practice. 
So let's talk a little more, if we may, about Sudan. Um, as I said in the headlines, it's repealed the death penalty and flogging as punishment for consensual same-sex relations. The decision, of course, was hailed by LGBTQ activists as a step in the right direction, while noting that gay sex is still illegal in the country. Article 148 of the Penal Code of 1991, known as the Sodomy Law. Remember them? They mm -hmm. were in the mm -hmm. U.S. It wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Hardwick versus Bowers, yeah. It's still active and can lead to prison sentences of up to seven years, according to Pan Africa IGLA, a coalition of over 150 organizations that work for human rights and equality for the LGBTQ community. Last week, Sudan's Sovereign Council had approved amendments to the law removing death and hundred lashes as punishments for same-sex relations. These amendments are still not enough, but they're a great first step to the transitional government that's trying to implement changes. Noor Sultan, executive director of the LGBT group in Egypt and Sudan, told Reuters, um, we see this as a positive change on the path to reform. The East African nation was one of six countries, including Iran, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Nigeria, and Somalia, that imposed capital punishment for gay sex. Six other countries also have similar laws in the books, but they are not enforced. And I remember when I was teaching at Champlain, one of the books that, was, that we read as part of the curriculum was What is the What by oh, David Eggers. So good. It was good, but in it, um, it's based on the life, on the lost boys of Sudan. Right. Mm -hmm. And in it, the narrator, speaking as a lost boy of, Salon, of Sudan, says there's no homosexuality in Sudan. Right. That homophobic canard yep. that circulates widely. But anyway, so this is. Um, Step in the it's right direction, like as everyone says. Pardon me? It's just like Poland. <laughs> yeah. And Ahmed, remember in Iraq, the head of Iraq said, yeah. there's no, I mean, the head of Chechnya says it. It's just. I know. But anyway, so Sudan is recognizing that there's homosexuality and removing the death penalty. So. And that's positive. Well, maybe the transitional government will make more changes. Maybe. Uh, we can hope. Because movement is occurring in Africa yeah. very slowly, yeah. not to generalize about the continent. Yeah. But I could continue, but uh, I can pass it on to Keith. Well, I think we'll pass it on to Keith. If we have any extra time, we'll let you we, chime in. We know how to find you. That's right. <laughs> I'll organize so, my papers. Yeah. As people will recall, during the last legislative session following the difficulties encountered by Kyra Morris and Bennington. There was a change in how reporting happens so that the Civil Rights Enforcement Division of the office in the Office of the Attorney General, you directly report to them bias or hate motivated crime incidents. So anything that occurs, a report goes to them directly. Julio Thompson, who is the head of the division, said that between June 1st and July 20th, report hit there were 15 incidents of bias and hate-motivated crime in Vermont. Mm -hmm. In 2019, there were only 17. So people are seeing a real surge. There was an incident that occurred in Rutland where people spray-painted on the side of a building, white lives matter more. Mm. And Tabitha Moore, who is the head of the NAACP in Rutland, made a comment of, you know, this is what happens when people are either actively hateful, blissfully unaware, or unwilling to face the truth of racism in Vermont. It's going to keep happening. And what Julio was clear in pointing out is this is reported cases. Mm -hmm. You know, there are still, I mean, as we talked about the incident that occurred over the weekend here in Montpelier, there are more incidents that don't rise to that level or aren't being reported in. Wasn't there something in Waterbury Bridge or something where somebody wrote, was it um, A white that? nationalist insignia yeah. on a dam in yeah. Waterbury. 
uh, the person in Milton who was walking around and stealing flags. Oh, and then there's the guy that's painting over things, too. What, uh, yeah. Well, and th th those were sort of public <laughs> billboards. Yeah. The vandalism of the Black Lives Matter yeah. here in Montpelier. <clears throat> and then where people have uh, Black Lives Matter on roadways, people are doing burnouts right. with their cars to try mm -hmm. and disrupt it. Different topic. And, and I kind of missed this bill during the session, and it's being reported now because people are saying this bill is going to go nowhere. I've got your attention. It's H401, which was introduced by Representative Gene O'Sullivan. And in 2013, Gene O'Sullivan, who is from the New North End in Burlington, introduced the first piece of legislation making the National Guard accountable and having to report on an annual basis to the legislature all complaints of discrimination and sexual harassment. Oh. So what she was trying to do with H401 this year was to create this new position <clears throat> of chief diversity officer within the National Guard who would be responsible for the reporting to the investigation of discrimination, sexual harassment, sexual violence, sexual assault within the National Guard. Well, it's kind of going nowhere because, and here is the argument, it disrupts the chain of command. Mm. That by creating this position that is outside of and to which they are accountable, oh, that, that would disrupt how we do you know, we and they are creating a provost marshal position. Oh, the National Guard? Yes. So saying, oh, well, that's where the complaints could be registered. We can take care of this. Mm -hmm. I know how those things work in organizations. If, mm -hmm. yeah, Unless if, you have somebody outside, they, <clears throat> usually the chain of command does not work. Right. But. I mean, if there is no one to which you are accountable over which you can exert no pressure, how do you really bring about change? So, Anne, but, you know, there may be like... Well, we have a trivia, right? Well, there may be five minutes before the trivia question, yeah. so if you've got a quick story, I know the pressure's on you. I know it, and I'm very excited to have this time. Um, <laughs> I'd like to talk a little about... Thailand. You know what I need is an index for my notes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hundreds of Thai LGBT <laughs> activists and allies raised rainbow flags on Saturday evening as they called for democracy and equal rights. The latest in a series of youth protests calling for the government to step down. Several youth-led demonstrations have sprung up across the country since last week when thousands of Thai activists staged a coronavirus, defied a coronavirus ban on gatherings, and staged one of the largest street rallies since the 2014 military coup. They danced and sang and performed stand-up comedy, making jabs at the government of Prime Minister Prayuth Chan Hucha, a former, former army chief who ousted an elected government six years ago. Oh. Pride flags were waved against the backdrop of, Pan of Bangkok's Democracy wow. Monument. Um, the LG, uh, let's see, the calls came after, uh, there's dispute in the LGBT community after Thailand's cabinet backed a civil partnership bill earlier this month that would recognize same-sex unions with almost the same rights as married couples. Saturday's gathering was the latest in a series of protests under the Free Youth Movement, which has issued three demands. The dissolution of parliament, an end to harassment of government critics, and amendments to the military written constitution. Mm. Even if they don't step down from power today, we want to let them know that we won't go anywhere. We will be here be here, said a 21-year-old protester who gave her name as Yaya. <laughs> Even if they get rid of us, our ideology will never die. 
we will pass this on to the next generation. So they're really agitating against this government, but unfortunately they're kind of fighting within themselves about this bill because, you know, dare I say, I mean, people are saying, well, it's a civil, step forward. civil <laughs> partnerships better than nothing, and then another faction is saying, yeah, but... Didn't we have that here? <laughs> oh, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of an echo. Yeah. Anyway, there's turmoil in Thailand. Well, good, though. I'm glad they're out there. Well, yeah, and it would be nice to see... Well, it's nice to see agitation against this um, government dictatorship. Yeah. Well, I think we have a trivia question now, and thank you, Ian. So, oh, my great pleasure. And, and we're going to continue our you know, rabble-rousing and activism. Yes. So, 1986, Governor Madeleine Kunin recognizes liaisons representing Vermont's LGBTQ plus community. Beth Dingham was the first lesbian to act as liaison. The first gay man may have been Terry Anderson who also was one of the co-founders of the Vermont Coalition for Lesbian and Gay Rights, Vermont Cares, and has most recently just stepped down as the chair of the Vermont Democratic Party. So, well, so with you. that, I think we should resist. resist.